Classic. Classic of tea. Classic. Classic of tea. Ooh, classic. Classic of tea. Classic, classic, classic. Do you use classic of tea? Hi guys, welcome. Sunday Tea Book Season 2 is starting this weekend and we're going to be chatting about classic of tea for the next few weeks. So be sure to tune in to the live Sunday at 1 p.m. Before we kickstart this book, I want to share some of the background and give you all, and myself actually, a deeper understanding of the time so that we can all better understand classic of tea. Lu Yu's Classic of Tea was written during the mid Tang Dynasty about 1200 years ago, and a lot has changed since then. So it's no shocker that we really need to get ourselves into the mindset for max enjoyment. So a lot has changed, not only the way we grow, process, and drink tea, but also the way people live and view things has obviously wildly different now. So in this video, I'd like to provide a snapshot of the Tang Dynasty and how people enjoyed tea around that time and take a quick look at some of the tea tools they used and whatnot. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get started. The Tang Dynasty spanned 289 years from 618 to 907 AD. This dynasty has a special place in the hearts of Chinese people, even during the Tang Dynasty and all the way to present time. This dynasty stands for China. It represents China for Chinese people and people abroad alike. A major pride point of the Tang Dynasty is its prosperity and inclusivity. For example, Chang'an, the capital city, had a population of more than one million people and was seven times the size of Constantinople. The Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road promoted economy and culture alike. The West Market of the Tang Dynasty was the biggest market in the world and provided the starting point of Chinese silk, porcelain, and tea heading out of China and off to the rest of the world. While at the same time, many luxury goods were pouring in, being introduced into China, such as spice, incense, and many, many others. The overall culture of the dynasty was wide open. Commerce brought tons of foreigners to the country, and many of them even became officials in various departments of the state, including military areas. Some of these foreigners even became Zai Xiang of the country. So that's like a prime minister in a parliamentary democracy. Not quite the top, but really high up that ladder. And how about religion? Well, they were also very open to a bunch of religions, including domestic religions like Buddhism and Taoism, and even foreign religions like Islam or the Assyrian Church, Manichaeism or Zoroastrianism. Woo, that one was tough. Zoroastrianism, allowing each of these religions to follow their own natural development. All right, so let's switch gears a little. I bet you've all heard of the famous Tiger Mom. This was once a really hot topic, and whether or not it's the right way to approach parenting, it definitely reflects how Chinese people value education a lot. And that didn't come without some basis in tradition. From the very beginning, and I really mean the very beginning, the state-funded old folks home was located right beside the royal court. But this wasn't just a regular old, well, regular old folks home. It was a school for the elderly to pass along their knowledge. Then, 4,000 years ago, didn't I tell you I was right at the very beginning? There was a state-regulated education, there were state-regulated educational facilities and systems of teaching different subjects. After that, 2,500 years ago, hang on with me, we're getting there, I promise. Confucius started providing private schools, breaking a long-held tradition that only nobles should be educated. Finally, we arrive at the Tang Dynasty, where the state uses Ke Jua to select officials for the empire. Ke Jua was an exam system for selecting civil servants in imperial China. Imagine that a farmer or a blacksmith's child could become a high official of the country because of his ability and knowledge. 
This emphasized and allowed education to decide one's future and not social class. This was a very powerful message to the common people and perhaps the very beginning of the Tiger Mom. The Kejua system went on to be modified for modern civil service selection systems. Whew, that was a tough one. Including England, France, America, and other Western countries in the 19th century. These changes and adaptations of new and exciting cultural elements into various aspects in the society, and really the whole vibe of this time, made it possible for Lu Yu's classic of tea to become an instant hit. The book transformed how people viewed and drank tea and greatly encouraged tea to transform from a medicine and a cooking ingredient to a standalone beverage that required a discerning palate. Now, this was possible because during prosperous times, people are able to go beyond meeting their basic needs and pursue things of fine taste and culture. It's because open and confident minds are curious and interested in change rather than simply rejecting something because it's new and strange. So when Lu Yu proposed such a fussy way of drinking tea, people were fascinated and not dismissive or discouraged. And there's also this, abundance, this abundant crowd of educated people who are fueling this burgeoning tea culture adding meaning, adding implications, making Lu Yu's way of tea not just a trend of the moment, but a profound influence and a turn in the whole course of the history of tea. So, how did people in the Tang Dynasty enjoy tea? Many would simply say, well, they boiled their tea, and yes, that's partially correct. 289 years, though, is a long time, and how people enjoyed tea surely did not stay the same. After all, just look at tea in the last 50 years. Before the Tang Dynasty, tea was mostly used by people in the south. But during the Tang Dynasty, it transformed from a regional phenomena to a national one and became so common that tea was even compared to rice and salt, basic and important part of every common person's life. During the Tang Dynasty, in the early times, tea was still mostly a medicine or a food ingredient. There are records that show that uh, you could use fresh tea bud to make a strong cup of drink and use it like a mouthwash to cure bleeding gums. As a cooking ingredient, it was often used in porridge or congee, boiled for a long, long time and seasoned with salt, pepper, mm, maybe star anise, and people would sell this on the street. Can you just imagine that instead of a chips truck, instead of a chip truck, you got a congee truck with tea in it? Sweet. So just how do you enjoy tea, according to Lu Yu? Don't worry, we'll talk about all the steps and how-tos in detail during Sunday Tea Book very soon. But let me whet your curiosity with some teaware talk. In 1987, so pretty recently, based on how our discussion has gone so far, a thunderstorm struck the pagoda at Fa Men Temple in Shanxi Province. And while the people were trying to rescue the half-fallen pagoda, they discovered an underground palace. Can you even imagine that? Fa Men Temple was built 1700 years ago, and these folks found a hidden palace under it by accident. So during the Tang Dynasty, it served as a royal temple. This underground palace temple was full of royal items tributed to the Buddha. To make this discovery even more exciting, the stuff, like literally all of the stuff inside of it, was accompanied with detailed recordings about every single item that was tributed and buried. Just imagine that. Real life examples of all the many things that we've already heard of in writing, but we never knew exactly what they looked like, what they felt like. They were all found here. Okay, not all of them, but you know, a lot of them. <laughs> things like Mi Se Tsi, a top-notch celadon porcelain at that time, that is named in texts and known as a legendary and mysterious porcelain category that no one has seen for a thousand years. Voila, there it was. The discovery also corrected long-time misunderstandings. For example, the word Xiang Nian, commonly thought of as a fabric incense holder. Well, they found out that it was actually a metal ball-shaped incense holder at that time and bonus find, the delicate mechanics inside would keep the incense upright as, it, uh, as a person who was wearing it or holding it walked around, 
quite amazing. This incredible underground palace of wonders also revealed a full set of tea accessories. Yay for us! But not just any tea accessories. The tea accessories used by the emperor. The set is made of silver and gold and clearly recorded names that accompany them, helping us understand what each of these tools was used for. Chan Yan was a tea grinding tool. Lo He, a storage container for tea. Cha Zi, a teaspoon which was used as a measuring tool. Yan Tai was a container for salt. And this cute little container, the knob on top, had like a little opening lid. What went in there? I don't know. Pepper maybe? This extraordinary collection displayed what Lu Yu had written for us in Classic of Tea. Seventy years after Lu Yu died, these tools were entombed underground for good. Well, at least until 1987 anyway. Ancient text in antiques perfectly matched. An amazingly precious discovery. I'll pop a link down in the description below for you if you want to learn more and really dive into this rabbit hole of archaeological wonders. Alright folks, I really hope this video helped to rewind your mind 1200 years and get you revved up for the upcoming Sunday Tea Book reading of Classic of Tea. It may be a book from 1200 years ago, much of which is not really applicable for today's tea lovers directly. But as a classic, it still provides much useful knowledge. In our Sunday Tea Book, we're hoping to connect modern with ancient. Read beyond the words, explain the culture of the time, and learn helpful information about today's tea. Of course, to achieve this, we really need your help. We'll be going live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time so that you can ask your questions in real time and share your thoughts with our fellow tea lovers. It is going to be epic. See you Sunday at 1.